This is the Henry's Child Podcast. Am I crazy or am I just raving? Carl Sundberg, how's it going today, man? It's going great. Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming in. Last weekend, we, as Henry's Child, ran into you and your girlfriend. We didn't run into you, but we saw you at the Doug right. Fur at their oversold-out show, which wow. I was very impressed with. Oversold. Oversold. So what did you think of the show, man? It was pretty pretty dope. It was wild. Uh, I missed the first band, and then the second band was, uh, remind me. Shelter Red? Shelter Red, yes. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. God, those guys are so good. And from what I heard, uh, the guitar player also produced the new Jolly Mon album. Is that correct? That's my understanding as well, yeah. Okay. But they were incredible. And then, I mean, Jolly Mon. It, it was amazing to see because... What I liked is that they played their whole new album, which I had just listened to three times earlier that day. Yeah, that's uh, a good one. To get into the, you know, like, okay, is should I have bought tickets to this? Was it worth <laughs> the money? <laughs> you know, like, have they fallen off? But uh, I got to say, you know, like, it, it, the music was like, you know, there was moments of like that old classic Jolly Mon sound and then, you know, new stuff. And like, you can clearly hear an evolution, you know, that wasn't there Back in the day. Back in the day. Yeah. yeah, when we had John in here, he said one of the things, or John Bolt, who owned Elemental Records and, yeah. and signed Jolly Mon, uh, Sailing was kind of his first full-length CD that he sort of did soup to nuts, along with uh, Northwest Ungrunge. And Which I have still. Do you really? I have that. That's, you know, I've been looking for a copy of that. I do. And I've, I, I've found that you can go on YouTube right. and piece it together, but nobody's actually like... Put it all together. That's, I that's still cool. Have it. I'll, we need, I'll have to get we need it to, to bring you. that in. He was saying that um, they sounded better than they did back in the '90s. I'd agree. And absolutely, they were they were tight. They're definitely better musicians for sure. Oh man, well, that, and that's the thing, you know, like in this world of rock and roll, like there's the the concept that uh, once you get too old, it's not any good. And there's a lot of cases where that's absolutely the case. But there's also the argument that. In time, you know, real good musicians and people that take it seriously and want to continue doing it for real, whether that's, you know, actually being on a label and touring the world and all that stuff or just, you know, kind of doing what I would say we're all doing, which is being, you know, local musicians with a day job, you know, right. and a family and responsibilities and stuff. Never got the uh, golden ring of, you know going on tour with Guns N' Roses, you know, but I'll be a musician the rest of my life. You'll be a musician the rest of your life. The guys in Jolly Mon, you can tell, musicians for life. And yeah. because of that, it's just like anything else. The longer you do it, the better you get. So uh, that was definitely the case with Jolly Mon. Yeah, so speaking of being a musician for life, I found a poster and brought it in. <laughs> and it has this band on it. It's the, This band played middle slot at what I what I believe to be uh, 1995, and I believe yeah. it to be the the Wow Hall CD release show for Mumbles and Screams. Yeah, tell me about that band. Uh, it was my very first band, Hive, Hive. and uh, it was I, I started it in high school with uh, I, it. It was funny because I grew up in Florida, and I moved to Oregon when I was 15. Went to Sheldon High School in Eugene. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anybody. And I was a total loser in Florida, you know, like a little punk rock kid in a swampy town. Nobody, you know, I was in ROTC and karate and skateboarding. And, you know, I was going to start a martial so you, arts dojo. You, were the, the, you know, the, uh, the odd man out down, D &D, down south. I mean, right? comic books, everything that you could do that made you not cool in real life to kids in high school. I did all of it, you know. So, nice. Uh, nice. I'm so with you. when I moved to Oregon, it was like, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to be somebody else. I'm not going to be the picked on nerd that no one likes. You know, I'm going to be cool. And I didn't know what that meant. I just, that was my goal. I could recreate myself. I did a David Bowie before I even knew who David Bowie was. Right. And so I just started to, you know, do different things and kind of be somebody else. I started growing my hair out. And then the, I met this guy in a math class. He's like, hey, do you play guitar? And I totally lied and said yes, because I took a lesson once, you know, and I learned Sweet Child of Mine. And that was the extent of my guitar like playing your fingers skills. had touched the fretboard right. before. Yeah, I learned Bad to the Bone, you know, and I think Iron Man. Those were the three things I knew how to play. It's kind of all you need. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's rock and roll, you know. And I kind of knew what a power chord was, but, it, yeah. you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But I said yes, because I didn't know anybody. And I was like... 
that could be fun. Like it might be cool, right? It was always looking for the thing that could make me cool, you know, uh, what could get me chicks because let's be honest, that's why a lot of people that's join bands and start them, right? A big motivation. Yeah. Indeed. So I'm growing my hair out. I look like kind of a rocker punky kid. It's the nineties, you know, Nirvana and, you know, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, the Northwest was happening. I mean, it was, yeah. in, it was in our faces, but Eugene, you know, it wasn't, really considered part of that but it really kind of was in a lot of ways but so anyway i started this band and played a couple times and you know we both were terrible and then we got this kid named dan black who was a bass player and he was really good he listened to infectious grooves and the chili peppers and can slap pop bass oh there you and go we're like oh man we're gonna play skater punk and so we started you know learning punk rock songs rage against the machine which he brought into the fold and i was like who's this band rage against the machine oh man and so it was just like it continually grew. And then finally we had a band and we met this kid named Julian who we met through these kids that were walking down the street, listening to us practice through the garage door and asked if we wanted to play their eighth grade dance. And we're like, yeah, totally. But, um, you know, we'll have to find a drummer. And they're like, oh, we know a drummer. He's in eighth grade. And we're, you know, in 10th grade. And we're like, Pfft. We're not going to. Those are two long yeah. years. Yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. But he comes in and his mom drops him off in the suburban and he's got this massive, like, Neil Pert like kit and he could play. And he's like, You guys know Pearl Jam? And it was like, Yeah, let's jam. And so we played some <laughs> Pearl Jam songs and some Smashing Pumpkins and all the stuff that's in Guitar World, you know, that you can learn from Tab. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. And so we did that for a bit and then uh, we played that eighth grade dance. It was terrible. Uh, a lot of smoke because we had a smoke machine because that's what we thought you needed. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, sure. Uh, and then Dan Black quit, and then we found this other kid, Sean Gillum, and Sean Gillum was a totally different bass player, totally changed the band sound and turned it more like trippy because he was into delays and effects and flange and, you know, whatever you could do to affect his bass to yeah. sound like, you know, something else. And so we did that for a while, and... With him on board, I think it was him that played this show, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it was. Oh, the Wild Hall show? Yeah, yeah. this Wild Hall uh -huh. show. And what was crazy was that weekend we had played uh, that the day before or the day after. I'm thinking it was... Come in the day after, because that was a Friday, probably. Yeah, because this was a Friday, so it was a Saturday. We played this Battle of the Bands in downtown Eugene. For me, it was the most craziest thing, because you don't see the... You wouldn't see this same kind of response today in 2018. Like... From we were playing downtown in the in, in the in the you know the Keezy Square before it was the Keezy Square, right. and there was a stage there, and it was like a real stage, and there are people as far back in every direction. It was like massive, you know. Eugene Celebration was huge, and it still is. But like during the '90s, it was just like you just did that was like the coolest thing. It was like Bumbershoot, you know, or. Now, was, I remember it being a kid and it was a big deal. Yeah, it was yeah. like huge. And it, part of it was it was free for the most part. You had to have this pin. This is when they kind of started to move their business model, I guess. Oh, right, right. And so uh, we played this battle of the bands. And I remember watching all the bands playing because I'm, I'm studying because I'm like, this is a competition. You got to, you know, it's like I was very competitive back then. And I was like, we got to beat these kids. You know, what are we going to do? And so I'm watching all these bands and, and they're all OK. And but at the same time, I'm like okay, I'm going to bring it. I'm going to show this whole crowd what it's all about. And I did. We did. We all did. And I, I did a rock star thing. I took my guitar and I fucking knocked it on the ground, like, you know, the Pete Townsend move. Didn't break the guitar, thank God. It was the only one I had. Dang, Carl. Uh, yeah, wow. I mean, it was nuts. And, <laughs> and we started the mosh pit. Like, no one had mosh pits. And, you know, kids listening today in 2018 are like, what's a mosh pit? You know, like, they, they still don't do it anymore. This is what I'm talking about. Crowd surfing. I mean, it was insane. I was uh, cussing, yeah. you know, like, I was like punk rock. I was like Sid Vicious. And it was funny because it was the first time I had played in front of an audience like that. I, I think it was a Thursday. Because we played your sh this show after. I don't know. I just remember, you know, like, if it, it, was, if like it a... was the Eugene celebration, it wouldn't surprise me for them yeah. having, a, like, a Battle of the Bands the yeah. day before. Right. Because for, for those of you who don't listen or aren't from Eugene, really, they would do it like like they do every Friday night in Austin, Texas, where they just they just block off part of the street. And the, people whole just, <laughs> the whole city. The whole city. All downtown is Just kind off. of goes nuts. And yeah. it's just this big, giant art festival. Multiple stages. Yeah. There's, like, yeah. music. There's, like magicians there's right. like painters yeah you know it's this big kind of hippie fair thing i think fishbone played out 
at it this one, you know, or it, the one the year after. I don't know. It was it one of those. It wouldn't surprise me yeah. if, if they did. So, so you play this battle of the bands, and you and get we, these kids moshing, and, and and we're like, we're gonna win this. We're gonna win this. And then this band called Marigold. I don't know if you remember that band. I remember. But they Marigold, were like a poppy sure. kind of Beatles type of band, huh? real family friendly, real safe. They played after us, and I was just like, oh. Psh, we got this. Oh, and the other thing that we did that was total punk rock is we sold merch. They told us we couldn't do it, but we did. We bought, we'd made all these tapes. We recorded a demo at the Wow Hall with the old uh, sound guy, Todd. You know, like uh, Todd, over you, hours, you know, it's you funny. Him? Todd did our uh, entry for Sonic Explosion. Oh, wow. So we, because we already had a disc, yeah. John wouldn't let us submit that as entry to oh, Sonic to the geez. contest. Yeah. So we booked. I think like four hours with Todd. We actually had Corey Impens. Oh man, God bless his soul. Yeah, Corey Impens. I worked with him at CD World. Record it. Yeah, and he was he was kind of one of the main main guys at CD World. Yeah, we miss. I used Corey. to get drunk with he's him a, a lot. He's a good dude. Goldschlager. He, he was a good dude. We love that guy. Yeah. Uh, he helped out with with uh, Todd as well. And so before whatever show it was, we just went in. We did like six songs. You yeah. Know? And they totally were like. Just First cut, one live, take. Yeah. You know, just yeah. like the bass is all di and stuff. Totally. So, so, so I'm with you. So. Yeah. That's a trip. Yeah. Wow. Yes. I remember. So at the Eugene celebration, I do remember there were two things. You you weren't allowed to cuss because right. it was a family show. So yeah. the fact that you said like I said cuss we words, I'm like like crazy. Uh, you're, well, you're you're hardcore. You're reinventing right. yourself. Right. As this hardcore I'm, I'm be East a rebel, Coast Sid you know. vicious guy, yeah. I love it. <laughs> and then number two is you're right. You can't. So, so at, at the Eugene celebration, uh, not the Well Hall, not the Eugene celebration. You yeah. can't oversell the whatever the headliner is. So, right. so right. for them, I'm just assuming well, they just probably, told all of the bands they couldn't sell anything. Like it's a battle okay. of the bands, and they made and they made it very specific. But I had a backpack full of tapes. And we sold, I walked off the stage with the backpack and, and, and I mentioned it on the stage. I was like, if anybody wants to buy a tape, it's five bucks. And I walked off and I sold every single one of them. And it's crazy because I wish I still had one because it was like the original recording. I think I have a dad of it somewhere. But then we played, played the show with, with Henry's Child and it was like, you guys were rock stars back then. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, you were like the big, there was a big four. It was, it was Floater, Henry's Child, Jollymon, and then the, the, the fourth could be argued a lot of different bands. But, sure. you know, I would, for me, it was, it was Critters Buggin' even though they weren't Eugene. Or 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 uh, Moth was another one that was really kind of huge back then. Joey Weber's band, yeah. yeah. Or the Daddies. I mean, even though they weren't like rock, they were a huge Eugene band. They at the were time. a huge they sold Eugene out the band. Wow Hall they the were time. probably huger yeah. than Floater at that time, right? Obviously, yeah. because the second anybody heard the Daddies were playing, it was sold out. It was like immediate. I got to talking on Facebook to Howard. Uh, Howard Liebes is the was the manager of the Cherry Pop and Dance okay. back in the elemental days. Yeah. And he reminded me that they had, um, at one point, they'd sold out the Cuthbert Amphitheater. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a big venue, it's, man. I mean, it's that's huge. a big deal. It, now, that was post Zoot Suit Riot, though. Probably, which because, was 98. So, yeah. So we're a little bit ahead of the time right, right now. So you're right. So it depends on who the who the fourth. Be- I mean, there's no doubt that Eugene was full of just amazing music at the right. time, for sure. Yeah, and and that in that era, it was often ignored by uh, you know probably Portland and Seattle especially because it didn't really sound like that. Like I felt like there was a sound of Eugene, and it was very dark and gritty, and and tribal, you know. And there was a lot of I don't even know how to explain it, but it was it sounded like Eugene looked like it just felt like it sounded, you know what I mean? Like it just, no, it 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 sounded like Eugene looked, you know, cause Eugene is like, uh, people like to kind of gloss it up a bit, you know, they're like, Oh, Eugene, man. It's like Ken Kesey and the pranksters, man. And the dead. And like, it's like tie dye, man. But you know, my experience was that it was, a little darker than that. Like, I mean, the weather was, you know, it was always raining, you know, and coming from Florida, it was like a total change of pace. Oh, I like, bet that was a big was a, shock it, to your system. It, it, it took me a while to kind of get used to it. But that, I think, impacted the music, just like it did in Seattle, just like it did in Portland. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think that there was an angst that was different about Eugene. Like, it was like... You know, it was the little, it was the youngest brother of the three, the big, th- you know, if you go you Seattle, Portland, you know, and everybody else. Eugene was always fighting for that, 
it was the scrappiest young kid of the block. And, and because of that, it sounded meaner and more introspective in ways that weren't like Portland or uh, Seattle. Let's go back to this Hive in 1995 yeah. when, you, when you played the show. And you were saying before we started recording that this was sort of phase one of Hive. And, yeah. and, and at this point, you're pretty young. Are you still in high school? Or? I had just graduated. So September 15th, 1995, I was already graduated. I had just graduated. So you been through the summer of yeah. after high school. Right. Okay, very good. So you're still, I mean, yeah, you're still pretty green. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm and it's a three-piece. Th- uh, three actually, piece I still. just turned 18. Because my birthday is September 9th, so this was right after my okay. birthday. Wow. And For six days. You... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was an adult. Sub I was guy. a full man. Yeah. You get <laughs> drafted and buy cigarettes, right? That's right. That's About right. I can get a porno. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so this first iteration of Hive was, was a three-piece. Right. And you had... A pretty popular song was called Smurf. Is that? You <laughs> yes. Tell me about Smurf. Yeah. So Smurf is kind of an interesting song because, uh, you know, I... I don't have a whole lot of material from Hive's days in real form. I have a lot of practice tapes of after, like once we started to evolve and move forward and, you know, the way we did. But uh, Smurf was like an early song that we wrote, and it's fully lifted from a Henry's Child song. And and I didn't even really make the connection until this week. <laughs> You That's know, so like, funny. Because wow. I was li- I was listening to Mumbles and Screams, you know, just trying to, you know, I, I felt like I needed to like freshen up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I and I was like, well, I should probably listen to my band too, because we would probably talk about that. And then when I was listening to Smurf, I was like, holy shit, that's that's a Henry's Child song. Oh my god! And I even like tried to like sync it to see if I could ma- like how close it oh, was. Oh, you're hardcore. Kyle. Oh yeah. Oh, I Last night it. I was going down the rabbit hole. I was like, man, I'm embarrassed. Like they-, they could sue me. But I never thought I, you know, I I listen to you guys all the time, and I had that CD, and I think I wrote it before I had the CD. So I don't know. I mean, it, in my mind, I know I didn't consciously write that riff, but I must have heard it. You know, a, I gar- I I guarantee you, Richard it from somewhere too. Right. So, so it's not, I mean, you know, look. Well, Everything's derivative right. at some point. That's, that's so true. Uh, but it's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's, it's a different song. I mean, it definitely is, is immediately different after, you know, the, the first riff. But you can tell, I mean, when you listen to Human Being and Smurf, you go back and forth. You're like, oh, yeah, that is kind so of So would you riff. feel comfortable letting our listeners hear Smurf? Yeah. Okay. Should we jam it? Let's jam it. All right. Here we go.
like green like gold So that was Smurf by Hive. Oh, God. That's so crazy. this was on an uncompleted album, you said, from 97. Yeah. yeah, so, and that was kind of towards the end of the band, really, because um, by the time we recorded that in 97, we were already way beyond what that sounded like. We had gone into way more psychedelic eras, and, and what I was we were doing musically by that point was much more instrumental post-rock before there was a post-rock. And so that's where we were going. And we were trying to explore, you know, instruments and time signatures. And I started to take music theory. And, you know, we were really going down the rabbit hole of that with, you know, I was listening to jazz and Frank Zappa and world music. And I was working at CD World trying to network with other musicians. And so we, we started to branch off into that kind of not style. I mean, it, there was no style. We were trying to break style. We were trying to not do what we were doing. We we're like, oh, this is going to be cliche in a year. Like, we, let's do something wild. Let's learn and grow. And had this idea for you know a band that would be like a constantly evolving thing where it wasn't like a set group of musicians and there wasn't a set group of songs. It was just like everybody knows how to play really well. Let's see what happens every time. And so every session would be different, you know, and whatever came out of it, whether good or bad, that's what it was. And so it's beautiful. It, you were just a young artist, man. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I was doing it for the real reasons, right? I, and I never once thought like, oh, this is going to be successful or make money. I just wanted to do it because, you know, and the whole time I'm working odd jobs and, you know, working in kitchens and doing whatever I could do. Doing what you need to do to play. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Hive kind of dissolved over time. You know, we brought in Gabe Morley, who was in Yob, and, you know, it wasn't vibing really well. I mean, we're still good friends. Like, you know, I love the guy. And they... I've noticed over the years that, <clears throat> that not vibing musically yeah. has nothing to do with friendship. No. And and, and it's funny because totally. what you just did, I yeah. do the exact same thing. Like, I'll yeah. be talking to, like, one of my wife's friends or whatever, and I'm right. like... Well, we didn't really get along in this band, sort of thing. But yeah. he's like super, and she said, "Oh, is he just a Facebook friend?" I'm like, "No, he's actually a really super cool guy, and right. you would totally dig him." So, right. I don't but know. But musically, it just setting, doesn't. Setting yeah. up my wife's friends with yeah, peep musicians. No, but it's 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 really true. I mean, it, it, I know a lot of musicians that you know I, I wouldn't be in a band with them, but I think they're incredible human beings. Totally, um, totally. And that's what happened after Hive because I kind of. It did, we never formally quit. We never formally broke up. It just kind of went away. You know, Sean and I lived together as roommates while we were doing it. He would finish college. I was still dabbling in college to, you know, get money for <laughs> student <laughs> loans. The college and, dabbler. You know, uh, so, you know, I, I, I was really unfocused on that. I just, all I could think about was being a musician. And so over time, I started other bands, joined other bands. I was in bands with a bunch of different people, uh, Francois. He used to be the bass player for Northwest uh, Royale in the very, yes. very early days. Okay. We worked at Lights Music Center for a hot minute. We were in a band. That turned into a disaster. Lights for music, huh? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, that was the last, like, quote unquote, band I was in before I gave up. 
I just, mm. you know, I was living in my parents' house in a shed in the backyard. I was working odd jobs and hating my life and just really kind of going, okay, this isn't going anywhere. I need to do something. And at the same time, I started to realize, like, I'm really good at being, I'm a really good writer, right? So, and I'd been one my whole life. I wanted to draw comic books and make comic books. And then I, all my music in Hive was all storytelling. And I realized, like, yeah. I got a knack for this. I'm really good at it. So I'm going to be a writer. So I decided to go back to college, get a degree pursue journalism. I traveled around the country and wrote a sci-fi novel that never went anywhere. Uh, that's what I decided to do. And that put me into radio. And so it was like a, a close enough thing to music, to being in a band, to be around bands and not only around bands, but bands that I love, you know, and I right. got a job at K-Fly. I was going to go to Japan and teach English, but then this K-Fly thing landed in my lap right before I left. And that's left. like right up your alley of what you're, the stuff you're into. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the, you know, the 80s and 90s and, you know, 2000s rock. And, you know, so I, I, I excelled in, at that place. I became the program director. I had a radio show. I did a, a wow. metal show for five years. And I interviewed hundreds of bands, like everybody, from Guns N' Roses to Rob Zombie to Tony Iommi and Rob Halford. And I have all of the audio of those interviews. And so lately I have been working on a book of these interviews because I have all the audio. I'm going to transcribe them. So I've been slowly transcribing them and I have a two volume book that I'm writing with essays connected to either crazy stories about that interview or the band, the, you know, what they meant to me, you know, just whatever. It's just going to cool. be this uh, double book of heavy metal that I'm, wow. I'm working on and who knows if, if anyone will publish it, but I'm doing it, and I've now formally announced it, <laughs> so I go. have to finish it. Your hat is over the fence, my but, friend. Exactly. But while I was doing that, I, I ended up uh, getting sucked into another band, a, kind of not necessarily against my will, but kind of against my will, because <laughs> I didn't want to be in a band after my last experience that forced me to go to college and journalism and all that stuff. Cause it was such a bad scene. Like, you know, the singer was, you know, fucking the stripper girlfriend of the drummer. They were smoking crack <laughs> at practice, you know, turns out the singer was a pedophile and he got busted. And I saw his picture in the newspaper for doing that. And then I really like put all this together. I'm like, you know, everything you could possibly, and eventually the house that we practiced at that was over off, you know, 13th by the old library in Eugene, burnt to the ground. Oh my so goodness. I got out of there, perfect timing. Nothing happened to me, you know, nothing, I didn't lose any gear. I'd given up on music. I didn't want to do it because it was too much drama. It was just, I'd seen it over and over again, and I'd been doing these, you know, uh, I'd been doing radio and interviewing all these local bands, and I saw it on the scene, if you will, you know, everybody, sure. oh, the scene, you know, which is a silly term. I think, uh, but you, I, I just, I just kept seeing all these, you know, drama induced situations with all these local bands. And I just I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And in fact, when I was asked to join, we have guns, that was my only condition to join was there can't be any drama and not just with me, with anybody. If there's drama, I'm done. I don't, I don't have time for that. I don't have the desire to deal with it. And I, and I definitely don't think it's valuable to anyone involved. And what was interesting is I've told this story before, uh, and I know Toby has told this story, and some people have probably heard it, but how I got into We Have Guns was a weird situation because I lived with Damon Scobie. He was the drummer. Damon and I had just gotten out of a relationship, and so we were like, man cave, put the pirate flags up. You know, Let's put the gear in the <laughs> living room. We're going to have a drum set and the guitars in the living room, and True we're going to play can. wherever we want, whenever we want. You know, my girlfriend's not going to tell me not to put the amps in the living room and play too loud. Like, we're going to do all that. And, and Damon was a beast on the drums. He was in four bands at the time, kind of what Toby does. So he, I'd hang out and, you know, drink beers and witness this. And it was always fun. Or, or, you know, at one point, me and Damon were like, let's do a two-piece thrash band and we'll do just anthrax covers. And so we started playing <laughs> anthrax covers and we just jam out and have a great old time. And, and, and it was fun to play, you know, because I never stopped playing. I just didn't want to do a band. Right. And there's so, a big distinction with that. I very much. feel you. Yeah. Uh, because there's no pressure when you're just playing, you just pick up your guitar and jam loud. It's just cathartic. And then you're done. And then your ears are ringing and you're happy and you don't have to worry you about it. You don't anything. have to deal with promoters or yeah. paying Booking, out other bands or studio sh and, you know, shopping to label. screwing each other's girlfriends, you know, all the drama, right? You never had that kind of drama. See, that's good. That's good. Cause there but was I'm definitely that. That's a slippery slope, oh, dude. It's oh my ugly. gosh. It's ugly. 
And uh, so I, I, I was living there, and I came home one day, and the guys were playing. And they had a different singer, uh, Kevin Keenan. He was a phenomenal singer, I thought. Um, and the thing about Guns was, at the time, everybody was in other bands. It was a side project. It was like Toby's, Toby the drummer of Grinch, you know, which was at the time like, oh, one of the right. biggest bands okay, sure. playing, right? They were legit. And so Toby was playing guitar in this band, which was totally crazy. Like, what drummer knows how to play guitar? And good. Like, he was really, he had <laughs> no, good Toby songs. Does. <laughs> you know, yeah. He, he, and, and they were really good songs. And I remember hearing them play these songs with a different singer and a, a different guitar player. Tyson was the, one of the originals. But it was like a super group because all of them, everybody in the band was in different uh, projects that were es- established and, you know, touring and whatnot, recording albums. And we, we Have Guns wasn't We Have Guns. It was, at the time, Army of Defiance is what they were calling it. And so I came in one day and they were just jamming and a couple of the guys were outside and I just stormed in. I was pissed off. I was like fighting with my ex-girlfriend and then somebody was parked in my spot at my house and I just come in and you know, I just grabbed the mic and I just started like screaming into it. I was just like, you know, and I was, and I was kind of doing like this, like Phil on Salmo from Pantera, you know, kind of, you know, like this cookie monster, you know, oh type of, you know, like cup the, you know, And it was ridiculous. And I was just having, you know, I wasn't doing anything more than just screwing around. You know, one of the lyrics that I was singing was, uh, Wizard Sleeve Steve is going to check you out. Like, what? (laughs) Like, doesn't make any sense. Genius. Yeah. So I went back to my room upstairs and, you know, whatever. And then a couple days later, I get this call and Toby's like, hey, do you want to be our singer? And I'm like, no, you have a singer. You're going to do two singers? You're going to be like Linkin Park, you know? Like, and he's like, no, no, we're going to replace the singer with you. I was like, whoa, definitely not. Definitely not going to do yeah. that because uh, I don't want the drama. And so he, they kind of begged me, and they were like, look, just like a drug dealer would, just try it. Just give it a try. Just, <laughs> just come to practice and just have fun. And if you don't like it, if it doesn't work, we don't have to do it. They did a practice without him at my house, and I did it, and I loved it. And, I, and, and it was crazy for me because I've never been formally a vocalist, even though I was the singer in Hive. I was a guitar player. So singing and playing is right. okay. totally a different game. And you have to give a little on both sides. Like, I can't play really complicated stuff. I can't sing really complicated. But when you're just the singer and there's nothing else in the way, you can do all kinds of stuff. And you can, you can, you know, you can push yourself in ways you didn't before. And, you know, I said, what do you want me to do? Like, what kind of vocals? Like, I mean, I was doing the screamy thing. Like, do you want me to do that or do you want me to sing? And they're like, do both. And I was like, well, fuck it. I'll do both. And so I did. And so... <laughs> I liked it. They ended up, you know, having the hard conversation with Kevin. They took him out for drinks and said, hey, we're going to bring him in. And there's, I ended up the singer, and, and the first song I wrote was Brethren. And I didn't come up with the song titles. They were all Toby songs, right? And what was crazy about, you know, getting this opportunity uh, was how good the band was. It was a mm. phenomenal band, and I, I enjoyed listening to You know, you hear bands locally, and you're like, eh, yeah, it's okay, whatever. You don't... I don't need to tell people about it. I just saw it last night. And it was cool. But this band was like, these guys are fucking awesome. Yeah, I love this. They're good. And to think that I was then the singer and the front man and I didn't have to play a guitar was crazy to me. But at the same time, I was so terrified that I wouldn't be good enough. And mm. so I always had this complex in the back of my head that I'm not good enough. Like I'm not as good as the last guy and I don't really sing very well. And so why am I the singer? I should be the guitar player. Oh, no, no, no. Stop singing that. You just have to be the singer. You have to, you <laughs> know, I'm constantly out. having to like reassess. And so I, I so to, to help me do that, I focused on my writing, right? Because I'm a writer. I'm not sure. a, I'm not a opera singer. I can't sing really well. I sang in choir and, you know, church, but I'm not a singer. So I focused on that. Uh, the writing part. And, and the first song I ever wrote was Brethren. And I, I came home from work, work in the radio station. I ran upstairs and everybody's there getting ready to play. And I'm like scribbling all these notes. And, and I just wrote the song. And I wanted to pay tribute to what they were because at the time, Army of Defiance was their name. So that is the first line I started with. It's literally, we are an Army of Defiance. That's the first line of Brethren. And wow. it comes from the name of the band. I was yeah. paying tribute because that's what they were. We are an army of defiance. Duh, that makes sense. And so I went from there, and I knew that the song was called Brethren. So what is this song about? Well, I thought I was trying to create it as if it was a, uh, this song was going to be our anthem. This was going to tell our story. This is us. This is who we, we are. 
and I didn't know who we have guns were. We didn't, we came up with that later with a pawn shop sign. I wrote those lyrics in one sitting and it was funny. I ran into, I was going through stuff in my studio, uh, here two weeks ago and I actually took picture of the, that sheet that I, I kept. Oh, the original, the one. original wow. lyrics. And some of them are wrong and different than what yeah, ended yeah. up as the, got on the record. Right. right? Okay. Cause it's the first draft. And so, uh. It was crazy. And so from that point on, like, it was like every practice I would write another song right before practice and I'd practice that song and I'd have it written down and I'd be, you know, writing it. And one of my other favorite songs, and I think you mentioned you played it, was the Dead Rising, the zombie song, which has the line, good thing we have guns. And I worked so hard to get that in there because I wanted to be like Bad Company or, you know, the bands that named themselves in their music. I always thought that was baller. And so... I'm writing the song and I'm like, well, how do you kill zombies? And it all just worked. So that's, that's how that happened. And then the, it just took off because, because of where I was working, I had recognition. People yeah. knew who I was. And so yeah, sure. the guy from K-Flies, the singer of this band, well, that's got to be terrible or really good. Which I, and so we had our first show was at the Wow Hall. We like opened for, I think it was Grinch, obviously. And it was packed. It was nuts. We never played before. And so the and it was kind of like easy success. Not easy, but I mean we played plenty of dead shows where there was like, you know, four people in the audience in Roseburg or whatever. Sure, we all have right. done those. If, yeah. you, if you haven't done that, you're not a musician. But, you know, it had a seven year run and it was fen- phenomenal, you know. Um we had a bit of a falling out, Toby and I. We've talked about it. I've made it very public about what happened and how that all went down. There's, it's on my blog, Reasoning with Madness. It right. wasn't a parking spot? No, no. Okay. It, was, it was much more involved. Uh, we became friends again, you know, after that fact. And we're still friends. And we're doing a project now, a pro, post-rock project. I'm playing bass. Toby's playing drums. Dave Affinito from Hiding Jackal is playing guitar. And uh, we're kind of just, we're having fun with it because that, I know that Toby's in your band and 45 others. Right, right, so yeah. I don't know how he does He's that. He's a busy guy. Yeah. You Google know. calendar. Yeah, exactly. That's how, that's how. But I will say it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing because every time I, th- it's like uh, in The Godfather, you know, every time I think I'm trying to get out, they bring me back in. <laughs> every time I think I'm done playing music or done with radio or done with this, it just brings me back in, uh, and I can't escape sucks it. Sucks you in. It does. It does. Well, look, man. I mean, you've been able to figure out how to make a living around radio, right? You know, it may not be your favorite thing in the world, but right. somehow it's or ugly. another, you've. I mean, I got to hand it to you, man. That's that's better than the rest of us did. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm no rich man. Let me tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you don't with do you. it for the money, I'm you know. With you. But so, yeah. does this post rock project have a name yet? It does not. That's always the hardest part, isn't it? Oh, it truly, yeah, name. it really Which, is. Speaking of names, I have to know where did Henry's Child's name come from? You might have even mentioned this. Henry's on a Child the, podcast. The, before. the name Henry's Child goes harkens back to the days when Andrew Smith was a vocalist, Rob Winia from Floater was the bass player, and mm. Pete Cornette from Floater was the drummer. Oh man! And they were called together. They were all kind of called Henry's Child. At least this is my understanding. Yeah, I didn't uh, really hang out with those guys till right. Around 94, I started kind of stalking them. And then around <laughs> 95, they asked me to join join them. And it actually comes from the movie Eraserhead. So it's kind of in, a, in, a, in a, a cooler way, like Steely Dan is the name of a dildo from William Burroughs' novel, Naked Lunch. In kind of a cool, <laughs> in kind of a cool way, <clears throat> but also a kind of semi unrelated sort of way. Right. But I'm with you. No, it's uh, that that's where the name comes from. So nice. Yeah. Good luck on on. You want to have a contest or something? If somebody... I mean, if someone wants to, uh, first of all, they'd have to hear the the music. I don't know. I because how that's we true. have guns. The name for we have guns came from a pawn shop sign, and at the time we had you know you know the process of trying to come up with a name. You're just like. So do you guys feel like you, do you feel like you guys had to change it? I mean, was that like how did it, or were you just like, oh, we could come up with something better? Pretty much right away when I got into the band, they were like, yeah, we got to come up with a different name. Let's let's come up with something. And it's funny because the name before that we all were like, yeah, this is great, was the B. Arthur Rape Machine. Wow. Yeah, that's that, pretty hard. That before. was the 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 working title uh, until Guns came through, and then how it came through. Um, Toby and Tyson, the original guitar players, uh, they came over to practice and, you know, we're all hanging out and they just walk in and they're like, we got a name. It's perfect. We have guns. And I was like, as soon as they said it, I was like, yes, that's it. 
And I don't know why it was that. And, and I was like, where did you get that? And they're like, it was on a pawn shop sign. And, it's, <laughs> and, it's, and it was in a pawn shop sign in Glenwood. And what's great is our first EP, uh, the cold-blooded EP, which is hilarious. It's a you know, Dave Chappelle joke. Uh, it's the picture of the sign. It's that sign. We have guns on, you know, nice. and I think it's still in Glenwood. If you drive, there's through. only like four businesses in Glenwood, right? And they One all have of them guns. Used to be Rogers Recording <laughs> Studio. Wow, yeah, nice. and they all have guns. Yeah, they do. Good. They all sell them. They all have them. Well, thanks for coming in, Carl. Appreciate you making the time. It's, Absolutely, it's thanks Friday for having me. It's starting to get warm outside, so we're kind of getting out of this, out of the uh, office in uh, Portland, which is where we're recording this podcast. Yeah. And you mentioned that you have a podcast. Yes. Yes. I am uh, relaunching a podcast that I started shortly after I lost my job in radio. When it stopped, it was like a car crash for me. Like, you know, I, would, I had gone through a lot of heavy, dark stuff in my life uh, leading up to that point with my family, with relationship stuff, with you know, all kinds of real big struggles. When that happened, it was like the, la- it was like the last straw. Like I was like, fuck, what else can it can go wrong? Which you should never say, knock on wood, yeah, yeah. because it <laughs> the, something will. But it was crazy because I was living in a house on Garden Way at the time that I had lost my job, which was the first street I lived on in Eugene with Hive. So I moved into this big, big old house, all these dudes, you know, it was a big frat house type style with bands and DJs and everybody like, you know, it was just a crazy party house and it was on Garden Way. And here I was at the end of my run, if you will, in Eugene. And when I lost my job, I was like, this is it for me. I'm done with you. I'm done with this city. Like it's all perfectly like tied up in a perfect circle, you know, like it just, I, I started here. I ended here. I'm getting the fuck out of here now. And I did, I ended up getting a call from the job I have now, you know, and it was a radio job. And at the time I was working at an acoustics company in Eugene and I was hating it. It was part time. And, you know, I was hustling, freelancing. And I had started this podcast because it's, it's like, uh, when you get in a car crash, your whole body is in shock. And so you don't realize the damage yet until afterwards, you know, like everybody right. talks about, like your back totally. doesn't hurt until the next day or the next week or whatever the real damage is doesn't get felt until later. And so I felt like I was immortal. I was just like, you know what? This is no big deal. Whatever. You know, it's like that meme with the dog on fire, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is no big deal. You know, whatever. It's just my house is on fire. I'm just on fire. Yeah. And so my life was on fire. You know, my, everything was done. I was literally like, I had become this guy, the standard ass Carl. That was my radio name. That was who I was for a lot of people. I was the guy from We Have Guns. I was the guy that wrote in all these magazines and newspapers, blah, blah, blah. And then I didn't know who I was. And so I started mm-hmm. listening to old Hive tapes and started dubbing them into my computer so I'd have a digital file of them because I didn't have anything to do. And so I, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do a podcast because that's what I'd rather do. I can say what I want. I can do what I want. I can make it crazy as, as, as all hell. I could do things that I couldn't do in radio. And I had all this empowerment. And then the pain hit. And I realized I didn't have it in me. And so I did like three episodes. I did one alone. It was kind of a test to see if I could even do it. And then I did a second one with my buddy Dano from the Athearchist and Kronk, the old bouncer from John Henry's. And then I did a third episode with Andy Andrus and Mac Chase, which I never actually aired uh, <laughs> because that was when it like, that's when the pain hit. Like oh, yeah. I just was sitting in, the, in yeah. my office editing one day, like I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I hate this. I hate everything about talking into a microphone, being around a board, you know, being a musician. Like the whole thing just repulsed me on every level. And I was just like, I'm done with all of it. I'm not going to be a musician. I'm not going to be on the radio. I'm not going to do radio. You know, people had off. I had turned down a job in Colorado Springs. I had turned down a job in uh, Oklahoma or something. I don't even remember. Uh, good jobs. And I just, I just couldn't. I couldn't stomach it. And so I put it all away and I said, I'm not doing any of it. I'm, I, I, I want something else. I don't care what it is. It can't be connected to any of that. And so the podcast got shelved. I just recently bought a house with my girlfriend. I've kind of established now here in Portland. I got a semi-decent job, I think. Life's a little better for you. Yeah. You know, days. a lot of the darkness that I was going through has kind of resolved in a lot of ways. My family's doing a lot better than it was. And lately, I, I, you know, I started playing music again with Toby and, you know, I started playing bass, which is weird because, you know, I've kind of played bass over the course of my life, but never like 
oh, I'm going to be a bass player. But until recently, like, I fucking love it. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. It's a lot of Bass fun. is a totally, it's its own thing. So uh, I started doing that, and then I, you know, Toby and I got together, and we jammed out, and it was like, yes, let's do this. And so I'm kind of doing that now, and I got this podcast that I've been building. I'm getting the gear together and trying to put it together, and uh, I hope to launch it probably maybe in a month, maybe two months. Wow, Depends nice. on how... Another Dumb Podcast is the name of this thing. Uh, nice. Okay. So Another Dumb Podcast. We'll be yes. on the lookout for it. Yeah. When the first one comes out, I'll make sure to announce it on the closest <laughs> Am I Crazy or Am I Raving podcast, which is which we landed on with ours. Excellent. And that's so, a great name because it's very you know, appropriate. It, it, it's funny. We were, uh, we were sitting in a landmark education seminar, and Andy leans over to me, and he goes, I would totally click on a podcast that says, am I crazy or am I raving? <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. And that's where the name came from. Yes. So amazingly simple. Well, when I, when I get mine together and I'm actually doing it, I'll have to have you guys come on as uh, special guests, do a little pod trading. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. I'd be into it. Thanks again, Carl, for coming in, man. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Oh,